That was a very, very kind introduction, Maria. Thanks so much. And um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a really big honor for me to be invited here. So I'm very appreciative of this and to be introduced by my, for those of you who don't know, Maria is also my PhD supervisor and uh, a friend, of course, and one of my favorite mentors. So it's really, really nice to have her introduce me and be here. Um, yeah, so today I really, I want to talk to you about the expressibility of quantum machine learning models and like what this means. So it's less, less a talk of like, um, this is all my research and this is how I did it and blah, blah, blah. I think it's more like communicating a little bit my thoughts around what it means to have a model, uh, a quantum model that is expressive. And I think this is um, quite a difficult thing to, to understand. And so hopefully I communicate um, some of these ideas and really, you know, this is a hackathon. So I want to kind of inspire you instead of um, instead of just showing you what has already been done. So it might seem a little bit out there, a little bit crazy, a little bit speculative, but we are already doing quantum machine learning, which is arguably quite crazy, right? So um, so yeah, so keep an open mind and um, hopefully you find this a little bit interesting and inspiring. So, but first I also want to just uh, highlight a few fun things. So I was at the last QHack, which it's crazy to think was two years ago now already. Um, I got to see Xanadu's offices in, in Toronto and I'm a, I'm a big fan of Xanadu, so to be invited as a speaker, again, is really such an honor. So I'm, I'm very happy to be here. And I uh, also took this, so this is me and my team hacking away at the headquarters, which is really awesome. It's on this rooftop of this really tall building. And uh, this is a picture I snapped of Maria and Seth. So Seth Lloyd is you know, also one of the major contributors to the field of quantum machine learning. And <laughs> they spoke on different days, and yet they both have the same gesture. So if you see me doing this during the talk, you know I want to be um, like Maria and Seth. So. But yeah, this is a really amazing event, obviously happened in person and hopefully the next one will be too, but I'm very excited to see what, um, what projects come from this year, this year's event. Okay, so machine learning and um, maybe even just nature, right? So we, we often make this assumption that there is some relationship that exists between inputs and outputs. So inputs, let's say I call them X and outputs Y, right? So this could be some data, maybe pictures of, of cats and dogs and their labels. And this true relationship that exists, let's say it's modeled by some function G. But in reality, we don't always know this true relationship, right? we don't always know this true function. And so what we try to do with machine learning is we try to approximate this, this function G with some other model, some function I call it F here. And this model is typically parameterized, meaning it depends on some parameters that we tune and we, we optimize to try and get the approximation um, as robust as possible. And very often we don't have access to all the data, right? So we have some subset, which I call X bar here, and we try and approximate true relationships between inputs and outputs with some parameterized function. And um, then I guess the natural question is like, once you've picked a model, you want to know how good is it, right? So if now I look at a different subset of the data, how will my model perform? And in general, how will the model perform on new unseen data? And this is exactly what Maria was talking about with this idea of generalization. How well does your model generalize on new data, new information? And if you pick a model, then it will have some inherent like errors associated with it. It will make mistakes inherently, right? Because you're obviously not going to pick the, the perfect model. So this inherent error that's associated with your model is the thing we call generalization error. And so, um, just to like reiterate and confirm this idea of generalization error. So imagine like, again, you've got these, this data set and the pictures of cats, you throw this thing into a neural network, you train it, you have your training error, also called your empirical error. And then you try to see how your, your model will perform on new data, right? So you, you give it now new pictures that it's never seen before. And can it actually classify these cats correctly or will it make mistakes? And these mistakes really try to approximate the true generalization error that's associated with your model. And this is a really important concept, right? Because if we can understand this about models, then we can make interesting statements about how they will perform, right? How they will do, how they will generalize on, on data. And, um, and so then the question is like, how does one, can we make tangible, hard mathematical statements about models if we choose them? Is there like theory that we can use to, um, to understand this idea, this notion of generalization of models? And thankfully, um, there is, of course, wonderful literature that exists in classical machine learning theory that tries to understand this quantity, this generalization error. And so how people typically do that is through this idea of generalization error bounds. And uh, I just want to give you like the high level intuition of what this means. A generalization error bound is, is typically written in this form where you can imagine you pick 
some models, like some model, some parameterization, let's call it like this theta here, this small theta. And this model lies in this model class. So the space of all models that you could possibly pick from, right? I call this this capital theta. And once you've picked a model, then there's gonna be some true error associated with it. And we don't know this true error, but we know an empirical error. We can approximate this true error with some data, right? And this difference here is typically called the generalization gap, but this generalization error is really what we're interested in. And we can bound this quantity mathematically by something called the capacity. And, um, and the capacity, you can think of it just intuitively as something that tries to understand how expressive your model is. So what does that mean? It tries to understand how many different functions can your model express. And um, the more functions that your model can express, the, the higher the capacity, of course. And typically, these capacity measures, they, they try to quantify the size of your model class, right? So that's what this means here. And usually it depends on data as well. So this is, this is the idea of, um, of a capacity measure of a model. So the higher your model's capacity, the more functions it can express. And so if we can bound this generalization error by capacity, this capacity measure, this must mean that capacity is, is really important for us to understand, right? And then this makes sense. We want to understand how expressive or how powerful our models are. And so the next question, of course, I pose to you is, well, then how do we measure the capacity of a model, of a neural network, of, of any statistical model? And luckily, again, for us, for, for us in the quantum community, we can, we can borrow insights from the classical community. There are tons of suggested ways in which one can measure the capacity of a model. So I list like a whole bunch of them here that exist in literature. I, admittedly, I, I know very little about most of them. But the fact that there are so many proposed measures, right, capacity measures, and even more being proposed uh, as we speak, <laughs> um, it should tell you immediately that perhaps these are not all great, right? They should, maybe there are pros and cons to some of them, because if there was one that was amazing, then we would need to be developing more. So each of these measures, um, you know, I think it's quite useful to ask questions about them. So like, for example, are they, are they calculable in practice? Some of them are very, very difficult to estimate, especially when you get to very high dimensional models. Um, are they accurate? So can they actually truly capture the um, capacity of a model? What are the assumptions associated with it? Um, and can you do comparisons if you have um, a certain capacity measure? Is it meaningful to compare it to, um, to, for example, another model's capacity where that model has a different architecture? So these are the kinds of questions that I think are important to answer. By the way, my, a colleague of mine suggested that I gather these and write a blog post on them and uh, answer these questions like and pros and cons of each. So if anyone's interested in, in doing that with me, please uh, shoot me an email. I think it could be quite useful. Um, okay, but I want to just pick three of those, right? And just talk a little bit about them just to kind of solidify the concept of how we can measure capacity of a model in different ways. And so the first way is probably the most naive way, the dumbest way, right? Let's say like just simply count the number of parameters in your model. So if you have a model and you just like throw more and more parameters in, then naively or in, you know, like uh, intuitively, you can imagine that this model will start to um, capture more intricate relationships between your data because you know, it's just getting more and more parameters that we can tweak and, and optimize to fit the data. But obviously this is, not, um, this is not a very smart way to do things, right? Because if you just simply over-parameterize you might not be doing a smart thing here. You might be introducing parameters into your model that are not being used, they're not active, they're not necessary. And so in some sense, just throwing more parameters in your model doesn't always increase its, its capacity. And this, this idea is, is perhaps not so elegant. Um, so then there's this idea of the VC dimension. And this is probably the most popular um, in classical neural networks, deep learning theory to understand the power or the expressibility of a functional class, of a, of a model class. And uh, how the VC dimension works is not so important here. What I want to highlight though, is that um, even though this measure is, is very desirable, often from a theoretical point of view, it's hard to compute it in practice. And sometimes this measure can even be infinite. And then what does that mean when you compare two models with infinite uh, VC dimension? And also these generalization bounds, which I spoke about earlier, we usually want them to be as tight as possible so we can make really nice, concise statements about, about models. And, um, and so these bounds that we draw from the VC, VC dimension are often quite loose. So this is also not, uh, not so great. And then lastly, now there's this idea of the effective dimension. And the effective dimension has been around forever, but I think it's kind of new in that we're thinking about it now in a machine learning context. 
And the effective dimension has, I like it because it has a beautiful intuition. It's easy to understand and it can be represented just by this picture of clouds in the sky. And so the effective dimension really, you can think of it as, um, so clouds are embedded in a three-dimensional space, but the space that they actually occupy is, um, is their effective dimension. And that's 1.37. So the effective dimension is actually 1.37, even though they're embedded in a, in a three-dimensional space. And so the effective dimension really just tries to capture a model's parameters that are actually being useful, like actually being used in your model. So it tries to measure, instead of just blindly counting all the parameters, it actually tries to quantify what parameters in your model are being used. And in, in that way, it also kind of um, measures the redundancy in your model as well. So this is the, the intuition behind the effective dimension. Okay, so talking about capacity measures from classical machine learning theory, now. Can we extend these to understand quantum machine learning models, right? This is, this is ultimately what I want to get to. Um, and what I want us to think about is how can we use these to understand the power, the expressibility of quantum machine learning models? Can we even do so? And the answer is it really depends. It depends on the measures. So in some cases, I think it's fairly straightforward to, to extend, but in some cases, not so. So one case in which, um, we have done it and we have explored it is, is the effective dimension, which is why I highlighted it. So um, in this piece of, of work, which we posted on the archive not so long ago, we, um, we found that the effective dimension, so we picked a, a specific quantum model that we thought would be interesting. We thought it would be quite expressive and we compared it to a classical feed forward neural network, which is um, something that comprises, I'd say the foundation of deep learning uh, networks and models. And um, this is just a, a toy model, but what we saw was that the quantum neural networks, what you're looking at here is the effective dimension. Effective dimension is normalized, so the maximum it can go up to is one. And it's the effective dimension as we increase the number of data in our model. And uh, you can see that the quantum neural network looks you know, significantly higher in the effective dimension. And we scale this model up to about 10 qubits. So we do these numerical analyses and we see that this relationship really holds here. And we search over all possible classical neural networks, like with this feed forward, fully connected architecture with different activation functions. We really do like quite a robust search here to try and find the best one. And then we plot its effective dimension, which is just far lower here. And this is interesting, this is cool, but I mean, it's very specific, right? To this, to this one kind of numerical analysis. And um, then we tried to dig a little bit deeper and, and ask the question like, why? Why does this quantum model have um, an interestingly very high effective dimension? Um, and I should probably also say this comparison was done with, um, with both models having the same number of trainable parameters in each case. So if the effective dimension is higher for the quantum neural network, then intuitively we can think of it as the parameters in the quantum neural network are simply being more active. They're more use they're like more useful, I'd say. Um, okay, so why, right? And if you look at the effective dimension formula, um, looks very scary and uh, very busy, but actually it's, it's not so that it really, you can think of it as just depending on two things here. So this is saying the effective dimension for some model. Um, and inside this formula, what I just want you to, to no notice is that it depends on N, so N is data. So it's a data dependent sample, which is um, data dependent capacity measure, which is really cool, right? Because um, in real life, we, we often have finite data. So this is, this is a, nice, uh, a nice incorporation of that. And then it depends on this F here, this F or this F hat. This is the classical Fisher information. And so the Fisher information you would have heard about a few times, and I think you'll also hear about it again um, in today's talks. And this is really the thing that's driving the effective dimension, the Fisher information. And if you and this is the classical Fisher information. And if you don't know what that is, then I explain it to you in two or three slides with intuition. So remember, I said that we have, um, you know, we try to approximate some true relationship with some model. And in doing this, by selecting some model with some parameterization, there are really um, two implicit mathematical spaces that are at play here. The first is the space at which one draws the parameters from, right? So this is your parameter space, the space in which you draw these thetas for your model. But then there is also this idea of your model space. And this really comes from like the family of models that you've picked, right? And this model space here is actually the thing that's interesting, the thing that, that, that we're trying to understand. And, you know, if you change your, if you like wiggle your parameters, Maria always tells me this, if, we wiggle, if I wiggle my parameters in parameter space, how will it, how will it move? How will it affect the model space, right? So these two spaces are, are 
essentially two different things, but we, we make our changes to our parameters, right? And so we want to understand how does it affect our model? How does our space of model functions change? And um, this is really the space that, that we're trying to, to understand. And so the Fisher information is so, so beautiful because in machine learning, you can interpret the Fisher information as giving us some information in model space. It kind of connects the, these two spaces together. And the Fisher information, really, you can think of it as like giving us some insight into the curvature of model space. So if I pick a particular parameterization, then the Fisher information really gives me some, um, some information about local curvature in, in that space, in model space, in that particular, for that particular parameterization. And um, if that didn't make sense to you, you can just simply think of, think of it as something that gives you insight into curvature of your model, right? And this is really cool and really interesting because, again, this is the thing that we're trying to understand, right? This, is the, this would be awesome if we, can, if we can understand our model in model space. And, um, and so the Fisher information mathematically, we can write it as a matrix, right? And if we can write it as a matrix, then we can start to examine it. And this is exactly what we did for these two models that I showed you earlier, this classical and quantum neural network. We looked at the eigenvalue spectrum of the Fisher information. And now finally, I thought this was really cool because finally we see something that's different, right? We see a different distribution of eigenvalues here. So the quantum neural network kind of has like a more, um, so this is just a histogram and the eigenvalues are at the x-axis. Um, the quantum neural network kind of has like a more even, evenly distributed spectrum, right? And um, the subplot over here is really just the first bin pulled out and plotted again. And so the reason we did that is to demonstrate that this classical neural network, if you look at the spectra here, the eigenvalues, most of them are negligible. They're around zero. And the Fisher information spectra is just highly degenerate, right? So all these eigenvalues are, are, are largely zero. And this is really interesting because uh, this is also, by the way, something that's known in classical literature where um, feed-forward neural networks with, with non-linearities, these activation functions, they have this, this spectra. And the spectra is actually undesirable. It's undesirable because of optimization. Um, you can think of eigenvalues that are zero. If, if you have lots and lots of eigenvalues equal to zero, then your model landscape is just extremely flat. And this is very difficult to train. So when we train these models, we see exactly this, this notion, right? We see this classical neural network, it trains, but not as good as the quantum one, right? And largely, this is perhaps due to this, um, this different distribution of eigenvalues. And this also translates to a higher effective dimension, which is, which is quite interesting. So in that way, we can tie a capacity measure to trainability, right? So this is one example of a capacity measure that we extracted from classical literature, applied it to quantum models, and um, also linked it to trainability, which, which I think is, um, is quite interesting. And then a recent paper came out, uh, which I thought was also quite cool. They introduced this idea of uh, effective quantum dimension by simply looking at now the quantum Fisher information. So the effective dimension I presented just now was uh, really the classical Fisher information. But there is also this idea of a quantum Fisher information, which you would have heard in Krista's talk yesterday. And they, they basically try, they define the quantum Fisher information as all the non-zero eigenvalues of the quantum Fisher information. So non-zero eigenvalues give you an idea of like how your model looks in model space, but it's like a quantum measure, right? So if your eigenvalues are non-zero, then, then these directions that you can go, these are like more meaningful, I, I'd say, um, or more influential than just having like a very flat landscape with, with zero eigenvalues. So this effective di quantum dimension, I thought was cool because it's um, a capacity measure that's solely designed for quantum models, right? It's, it's inherently quantum because it's got the quantum Fisher information here. So this was a very cool idea. Okay, so now just something I want to quickly um, explain or, or maybe make mention of, because this is something that I, I only realized maybe last week or the week before when, when talking to Maria, um, is that model capacity, so what I've been speaking to you about the effective dimension, the VC dimension, all these other things, they try to make a statement on your model's capacity, right? And your model's expressibility. But there is also this other notion of quantum expressibility. And this is different to, to what classical um, people, classical machine learning um, engineers have to think about, right? They don't, they don't have this other uh, dynamic. And this notion of quantum expressibility is something that you will hear about in all these, Q, in all these QR talks. Um, and what it is, is it's simply, how, how, much, how much can my quantum model access the full Hilbert space, right? So this is a totally different idea of expressibility. This is 
Um, this is, I, would, I call it quantum expressibility, but I mean, it's probably not the, the right term, but you can think of it as like, how does my circuit or my model actually um, tap into the Hilbert space? And this was a very nice paper that was, um, that was written by Hannah, who will also give a talk later today. And in this paper, they, they kind of demonstrate this concept of like how if you, let's just say we have one qubit, right? And we can represent that with a block sphere. If you have a, a circuit and like you apply very stupid operations, then what you can sample from this qubit, like what, from this block sphere is, is not, not much, right? Until you, you get to eventually a very general unitary, and then you can sample from the full Hilbert space. And this is a, a more expressive model, right? Um, because you're creating a circuit that can sample and tap into the full Hilbert space. It has high quantum expressibility. But, of course, this is not always a good thing. So this high quantum expressibility is also largely associated with these problems of barren plateaus, right? Which, which, you, which you would have heard in Patrick's talk yesterday, and Marco also gives a talk later. So this is really an awesome event because it's like all these amazing quantum machine learning people talking about these problems. So quantum expressibility the higher it doesn't always mean the better, right? So you could run into these problems where your loss landscape or your model landscape just starts to become really, really flat and undesirable, and now it's also difficult to train. So this is something I just wanted to highlight, is that it's interesting that a model can have very high quantum expressibility, but at the same time, it can have a very low capacity, right? And vice versa, it can have a very high capacity, let's say, um, the effective dimension, we use that as a capacity measure, we can create a model where all the parameters are really, really useful in a, in a quantum setting, but the quantum dimension, the quantum Hilbert space is, is probably very small. So in that sense, like the quantum expressibility is not, I don't know, not, um, not so high. So this is um, an interesting dynamic. And like, I don't know the relationship between um, quantum expressibility and model capacity in general, right? This is still open, but this is just something I want to highlight. I want you to, to think about and distinguish also that you can study a model and its statistical capacity, but there's also this other thing we have to think about in quantum machine learning, and that's really how to design like the quantum expressibility, the Hilbert space. Okay, so now finally, I want to just tie it back to generalization, right? Because this is what we, we started off with, and this is what we started to think about. And how does this all now fit back into this picture. And so I mentioned these uh, generalization bounds, right? So we can try and, uh, and bound this generalization error with the capacity measure. So for the effective dimension, we, we managed to, to accomplish this. And uh, the details of this, this very long um, equation here is not, not so important, but what is important is that we can actually bound this, this generalization error with a capacity measure such as the effective dimension and then apply it to quantum models, right? But this has also been done for other capacity measures and, um, and links to generalization error with other capacity measures have also been done. So I think a really cool idea would be to just naturally extend um, some classical analysis to quantum machine learning and see, do quantum models, um, do they offer anything interesting? Okay, and then if we can do that, um, another, another question or another potential problem or something to think about is like, well, how do we actually fairly compare quantum and classical models or quantum and classical neural networks, for example? Like in our analysis, we, we, um, you know, we restricted ourselves and that we looked at fully connected beautiful neural networks. We looked at a very specific ansatz. And, um, but how does this hold in general? And if we can answer this, or if we can think about this in a nice way, then can we think or can we draw from interesting insights that exist in classical machine learning literature, right? Because classical machine learning, the field is so fast paced, arguably as fast as quantum machine learning, and there is so, so much, there is so much there, and we shouldn't reinvent the wheel, we should, um, we should leverage that information, right? So, for example, one, um, one obvious thing, or one, one really cool thing to think about is like, okay, if you pick up any classical machine learning textbook, you will undoubtedly see this on like the first page, right? This is like the bias variance trade off idea. So, what you're looking at in this picture here is you've got like, you know, your error on the, on the, on the y axis, and then like, your capacity of your model. So how, how, how many parameters, right? You can think of this as like increasing your parameterization on the, on the x-axis. And then as you like make your model bigger or better or more capacity, whatever you want to call it, then your training error, right? When you train on, a, on your uh, training data set, your training error, of course, starts to decrease, right? But then there's a point. So this is now your test error. Your test error and your generalization error are often used interchangeably. When you check your model on your test error, right, you want to minimize this thing. And when you push your model too far, when you make it 
too, when you push the capacity too much, when you have too many parameters in there, then your model starts to fit the noise in your data set. And, and, in, and this is bad because then it starts to overfit, right? And so we see that the, the error starts to increase again. But what is um, so amazing and what happened or what came out in, uh, in a recent paper, or maybe not so recent, two, two years ago now, is that if you push your model's capacity, you keep, keep going past, um, past what you, you could uh, imagine, right? So you just like really, really over-parameterize your model. Then this error, this generalization error starts to decrease again. And this is, this is something new, right? This is something called, uh, this is a phenomenon called double descent. And, um, and so it basically suggests that we're, we're in this under-parameterized regime. Then we have this classical standard behavior, um, bias variance trade-off. But then when we just simply like, just make our models insanely big. And in deep learning now, we finally have the computational power to do this. When we reach this over-parameterized part, then the generalization error starts to go down again. And I mean, how fascinating is that? Because um, we're making our models like just really, really powerful in terms of capacity. And now we have these quantum models that are demonstrating high capacity. What does this mean? Can we expect this kind of behavior? Can we address overfitting with perhaps just pushing it so far with a very high capacity that we see this, this idea of like double descent again? I mean, I have no idea, right? And it might be too early to be thinking about these things, but yeah, like I said, I'll just be communicating my thoughts here. Um, okay, and something I want to also explain is like, why does this happen, right? Why does this double descent phenomenon happen? And the intuition is actually so, so beautiful. It's because when you push past a certain capacity, you reach this interpolation threshold. What does that mean? Well, it means that you are training, 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 and then your model has now reached a point where it memorized all the data, right? So this is like not good because like you, um, it, it kind of will overfit, it will, it will do some strange things. But then if you keep going, it's, it memorizes all the data and then it starts to interpolate between your data points. So it starts to like imagine all possible other data points that it can see or it can it can uh, receive and so the generalization error starts to go down again and this is this is insanely cool this intuition that that comes from this uh, phenomenon and it was so prolific that they actually the classical machine learning theory has now divided deep learning into two regimes they actually refer to this as the classical regime and this is the modern regime and so this is like the idea of modern deep learning okay so i'm almost done and uh, yeah so i i now want to just like you know pose the question to you is like, can we extend any of these insights into quantum machine learning? Um, and in doing so, like, you know, what will this mean? Like, can we, can we now borrow from a different capacity measure that gives us a, a different notion of expressibility? And what will this mean for our quantum models? And can we play around and design quantum models in an interesting way so that we can figure out what is, what is actually useful in there? Um, and so some open questions that I want to leave with you is like exactly this, like what properties do we need to have in our quantum machine learning models in our circuits to design them with a high capacity? And capacity here can really be defined in multiple ways, right? So this is also a, a question that we can, we can easily investigate. Um, and then what will this mean for the quantum expressibility, right? So once I pick a capacity measure, I figure out um, how to optimize my quantum model. Maybe it's a certain feature map that, that influences the capacity measure. Then what does the uh, quantum expressibility look like? Because now I have this, this added degree of freedom that I can play around with, right? And then can we use capacity control from classical machine learning theory to avoid overfitting and, you know, like address these um, other questions, like uh, examine things like double descent or other things that exist in other insights from classical machine learning literature. And then of course, like ultimately we want to get to this goal of, of answering this question or at least gaining a little bit of insights is like, can quantum models generalize better? I mean, this is obviously, this is something that's very, very far away, um, but how do we begin to think about answering these questions? And that is why we are here, right? This is why we are, attend events like this, like QHack, because we can start to build heuristic models that will give us insight into these questions, right? These toy models, theoretically, maybe, I don't know. So I love theory a, a lot and, um, I think it, it's, it's beautiful, but it's also very, very hard to make statements, especially when you have no insights. But heuristic models, toy models, playing around, hacking, building things, noticing that this model gives you a high capacity in this situation, but changing this gives you this. And these are the insights that we need to gain from, from, our, from our models to develop the theory that will, that will push our, um, our quantum machine learning field forward. And so this is what I wanted to say to you today is like, you know, kind of explore, play around, mess around, do these interesting things, um, ask questions like this and explore in a systematic manner. And um, 
yeah, and now I think I should stop talking and also wish you good luck and to the participants. And I hope that, um, yeah, you enjoy the hackathon and I'm very excited to see the projects that, that come out of this. So thank you for listening. Thanks so much, Amira. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, I'm also like my, my heart opened when I listened to you because so many things I thought like, yes, ah, yes, I think so too. But obviously I'm very biased. So. <laughs> um, I mean, we've got a couple of questions. We don't have a lot of time and I really would like to ask you also some personal questions because you're just, uh, you know, not only a cool researcher, but also a cool person. Um, let me just summarize a whole bunch of questions that came about comparing classical and quantum models. Um, you've answered, or you already said that it's actually quite hard to compare them. You're just like putting them next to each other. You obviously chose one mechanism in your paper where you compared them. Um, can you just like explore this a little bit differently? What do you compare to each other? Do the quantum models, do the qubits always compare to the nodes or do they compare to the amplitudes? Um, what are the choices you have and how could they actually influence what you find? Yeah, that's a super hard question. And I think, to be honest, like we don't really know, right? And I think everybody is trying different things and different ideas. And, um, and so what we did was we just like chose a parameterized model and, um, and compared it to something. We wanted to compare it to a class of models in classical literature that are really important or really fundamental, right? Which is why we chose feedforward neural networks, because they, they form these building blocks in deep learning models. Um, but... I guess arguably one could also say this is not a fair comparison, right? Because in these um, in these in these neural networks, there are these nonlinearities that that one can uh, play around with, and this really gives the model a lot of power. But on the quantum side, I mean, it's very 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 difficult to inject these nonlinearities. But some people do this by like mid circuit measurements and really clever things, and so I think it's at some point we have to just say, okay, this is what we call um, our quantum model. This is called what we call our classical model. This is how we compare it, but I think it's really open and it's really hard to do this and um, also sometimes very subjective. So, yeah, I don't, it's probably not an answer, but. Um, or maybe just uh, to leave the statement that when you compare these models, the, the problem is not so much getting data or writing a nice paper or running it on, on the quantum experience, but the problem is really what is the comparison, right? That's maybe yeah. 90% of the research almost. So. Yeah, and I'm still, yeah, but I'm, yeah. Still, I'm, still not com I'm still not so comfortable with. Um, with how people do it in general, right? even myself, um, because it's not fair at the end of the day. It's, it's not, uh, broadly speaking, I guess one could view both models as, as statistical models, right? In which you have probabilistic outputs, but then, yeah, I don't know. It's, then when you compare components of the models, it still gets a little bit tricky. So good question. And I think, I think yeah, there are lots of papers one can read to, to see what other people do, but I think it's ad hoc at the moment. Yes, related to this, there was a question. So do you know why the models you chose to compare, why the quantum model was better? So do you have an intuition? What was the power that that one used and that the other one didn't? Because we're using, we're using very small models, so often we know actually that what's happening there. Yeah, exactly. So um, our intuition was that, um, so we, we also did another comparison with another quantum model, right? So we also looked at the effective dimension of a different quantum model to try and understand why the one that we picked had such a good effective dimension. And the other quantum model that we looked at, we played around with the data encoding strategy. So we made, um, we made that model have a feature map or an encoding strategy that is easy to simulate classically. So we would expect that model to have a low expressive expressibility because you know, we can simulate it classically and we think the power is coming from all this quantumness that we're creating with, with the other strong model. And so when we looked at the effective dimension of this, this, this easy model with an easy encoding strategy, we saw that the effective dimension was far lower. So we suspect or we um, conjecture that the power of the model is really coming from the feature map, the way you encode your information into a quantum state. And, um, and I think this supports a lot of literature that exists already in quantum machine learning, where really the power comes from the data encoding, right? Maria, you know this um, <laughs> very well, right? Like in, in, um, in your paper with the Fourier analysis, I mean, this really highlights the data encoding is important. Um, in also the idea of kernels, this is everything comes from the, how you encode your information into a quantum state. So I think this is really where the power is coming from in that sense. Cool, thanks so much. Amira, moving a bit away from physics, tell us a bit about what made you get into physics. So it sounded almost like a religious calling or something like that when, when <laughs> I hear your story every time, but um, what fascinated so much, you so much about it? Did you ever regret it? And what could actually physicists learn from non-physicists, from people who do proper jobs? 
Yeah, so growing up, I was, um, so I always knew I loved mathematics, right? but I was always so intimidated by physics and, and even physicists. I, I regard them as probably the smartest people that I will ever meet, right? And, um, and I had this like very, I was very scared of physics, to be honest. And in fact, it was like my lowest mark in school. And, and I think it's just because I never really understood what it meant on a, on a larger scale. And so I, I did like a very traditional thing. I went and I got a job in finance and I studied, you know, like actuarial science and blah, blah, blah. And um, it was cool because it was math heavy and it satisfied that part. But like, I always felt like something was missing. Like, I don't know, I wanted to think deeper about the world. I wanted to think deeper about things. And this just wasn't getting satisfied with my job in finance. And, and, um, and so I always just tried to learn more and more. And when I came across um, the idea of the Schrodinger equation being applied to, you know, trying to model something, the evolution of, of a system through space and time, because I was watching how a stock moves through, um, you know, the stock exchange. The mathematics is actually very similar. It's like the same kind of partial differential equation. And then it clicked for me finally, like, wow, actually the mathematics that I love, we can actually apply it to, you know, think about all these crazy things like the universe, the world. And, and then I realized, oh my gosh, science and, and physics is actually so, so beautiful, so amazing. And uh, for the first time ever, I felt happy. I felt like alive. I felt like, okay, I realize now um, what I need to do. And so I did everything in my power to change my career path. Luckily, I was you know, fortunate enough that I could quit my job and live with my parents for, for a year and be a poor student again. And like, but like, it's just a series of very fortunate events that I feel very lucky. And from what physicists, I guess, could learn from, from non-physicists or what I could ask or request of physicists is, um, you know, give us a chance. <laughs> give, us a, give us a chance to like um, uh, allow some sort of diversity in, in the thinking, because I know a lot of physicists are, are often very, um, you know, very, very, obviously very highly intelligent, but also very, um, very strict in, in how they do things and how they approach stuff. And I think, um, yeah, if, if, uh, if I can ask for, for that favor and, <laughs> and what you could learn from us, um, yeah, hopefully, I don't know, maybe we bring these crazy questions which you don't like, but it will force us to think a little bit more broadly. And I think this is important. So. Yeah. It's, that's the most charming call for diversity I've ever heard because we always talk like diversity has to be about women and you know minorities in physics, but actually just like you know open up conversations. That's actually quite cool. Um, you took a second decision in your life that I found almost more impressive, and that was quite recently. And that was to so I know after your masters you had a lot of job offers, being in a field that's exploding at the moment, being a, a smart young woman. And you decided to actually stay at the University of Kosovo Natal, which I assume not many people out there have heard about. Um, and you kind of you decided basically to stay in Africa, and um, that's amazing. That's um, more amazing. So, if I do research in Africa, but I come from outside, is a decision. But for you, this is really a statement. So, what motivated that? And please don't say it was me, because I know you like to embarrass me. But <laughs> what's the thinking behind and kind of what's your vision here? Okay. Um, yeah. So. So I think a lot of people from Africa and South Africa will agree with me when, when I say, when you grow up here, your idea of success and your idea of like, you know, being um, at the forefront of any field is you must leave, right? That's the only way you, you go overseas and then you're, then you're successful. Then everyone's like, wow, they're, they've made it there. But then the more I started to spend time here, like I did my master's here and, um, and, you know, I did my master's at the University of Kosovo Natal. Again, this was really, really fortuitous and almost serendipitous because it was in the home in my hometown. I, I was working in Johannesburg and then I, I got this email from Francesco, who is a professor at the University of Kosovo Natal, and that's my hometown. And he said, when can we meet? I went back and, um, you know, and we had this discussion and I joined the group. And then I realized that um, once I spent some time there, I realized that we actually have access to amazing researchers, amazing talent, amazing people that I, I just learned so much from that um, it, didn't make, it didn't make sense to just uh, view it as going overseas is, is, the, is the idea of being successful, right? Because we have the talent, we have the resources here. And, um, you know, I can do an MIT course online and learn the same information and still be in Africa where I think there are a lot of opportunities. But really, it was, it's largely, I mean, Maria, you don't want me to say it, but it's largely due to the people that, that I had access to here. And one of them, of course, being you, Francesco, Ilya, all these amazing professors that, um, you know, it's, it's, at the end of the day, it's not about Cambridge or Yale, all these fancy names. It's about the people. It's about the researchers and 
that's where you learn the most, right? It's the professors. I'm not saying that Cambridge and Yale have bad professors. Of course, they have great professors. But my point is, for me, I already had this, and I knew I had it, and I didn't want to let go of it. So that's why I, um, I wanted to stay here. Cool. That's, I hope, also inspiring, because I think this is not an issue I observed in Africa. This is an, an issue of any continent that's not Europe and America, and maybe by now China also has really good infrastructure, but um, this like moving away idea. So maybe some people might reconsider and think of maybe going home and seeding something. Um, I have one last question that I want to shoot at you. Um, that's also more from well, a personal or research or life level. So you are, um, in many regards, my social media lifeline. I'm really bad. I haven't updated my LinkedIn profile in 100 years. I'm never answering anything. I think you've got millions of followers there. Um, can you talk a bit about social media? What does it mean for research nowadays? Everyone knows quantum Twitter. A lot of my colleagues tell me, why don't you tweet about papers that you publish? And I refuse to ever, ever do this in my life. I think I've tweeted in my life. But... So um, there's different profiles you can have. There's different styles you can have in research. Yeah. So what is this uh, social media, um, I don't know, knowledge for? Yeah. What are the researchers that use social media? What advantages do they have? What's the tricky parts of it? Yeah. What's the power of it? So, so I think, um, so I think I realized this the other day about why, um, why some researchers feel so uncomfortable about this. And I think, I think the reason is because it, you can view social media in two ways. You can view it as in one way as like, this big advertisement for yourself, right? Where you're like really trying to like get your name out there and promote yourself and blah, blah, blah. And you know, like this kind of Instagram kind of uh, view of things, right? And even like LinkedIn, you can, you can have that approach. But how I view it is I actually view it as a tool that's super, super helpful for sharing resources for other people. And when you have that outward view, instead of, you know, you're not trying to promote yourself and whatever, and you're trying to help other people by sharing papers that are interesting, by telling them about your research in a communic you know, communicable way, is that the right word? Um, communicative way, a way that they can understand, right? <laughs> um, you're trying to do that. And when you view social media as that, in that regard, you'll feel a lot more comfortable as a researcher using it and sharing information. Because this, I think, is really, really helpful. Because when I was starting out in my career, I was in finance and, um, you know, like everybody gets LinkedIn and we share like, um, we share interesting articles and blah, blah, blah. And I found it very useful. So I started to share stuff that I found useful. And this was always received really, really well. And, and I just kept doing that. And people were just really, really appreciative of the fact that you share educational content and resources. So like, I don't have Facebook or Instagram, but I have Twitter and I have LinkedIn because I view it in that way that it's helping other people instead of promoting myself. If it promotes myself, great, that's cool. I, I have gotten a lot of opportunities through LinkedIn and, and Twitter, like doing this talk and stuff like that. But I think um, I think it helps people more um, in a general sense, and that's that's important. At the end of the day, we want people to understand our work, right? We want people to um, be aware of quantum computing, quantum like uh, quantum machine learning, all these crazy things. So, yeah, I think that's um, how you should view it. You, you might have convinced me there. <laughs> Actually, that was, that was an angle that I don't uh, think about very often, but that's probably very much true because yeah. Um, Amira, I'll shoot you one last very quick one because I'm kind of ignoring a lot of the more detailed questions about your talk that coming in that are coming in. Um, just let me summarize it. What's next? Yeah, good one. Um, so what's next is, I think, um, a far more fundamental study, right? So, so in this paper that I spoke about with the uh, effective dimension, you know, we really just, we motivated the effective dimension as a capacity measure, and then we just tested on models we thought were good. But we have no idea on a deeper level, like why, why certain models are good, like someone, someone also asked earlier. Um, and so really what's next is to borrow tools from, different tools from mathematics um, and try understand these circuits in a, in a more deep, deeper level. So if it is the feature map that's giving us power, why? And, um, and this is exactly what we want to try and understand through the effective dimension, through things like the Fisher information. How do we design circuits and, and uh, models so that we can have these uh, these high high expressive um, highly expressive models, and then I guess the question after that is, is that even good, right? Because we don't even know if um, highly expressive models are are good for machine learning. So we have a long way to go, but um, one step at a time, I think, is how we do it. Yeah. Great, Amira, thanks so much for being here, Thank for you. sharing your knowledge, for sharing your answers. Thanks for not embarrassing me. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> I was tempted, anyways. <laughs> okay, great. Um, we are back very soon with our next speaker, um, and that is Leonardo Banki. 
Stay tuned.